In from the jagged coast of the Pacific, set along the serpentine route of the Russian River, and deep within the towering redwoods, the Corbell family came here in the 1850s to build a life, earn a living, and shape their own American dream. Today, their story is largely the story of Corbell California Champagne, a story of American celebrations. But it didn't start that way. It started like a revolution. In 1848, young Francis Corbell joined a group of students in Prague to protest the monarchy's repressive policies. There was gunfire. The police arrested Francis, saying he had pulled the trigger. He was sentenced to 17 years in Dalaborka prison. This formidable penitentiary had a distinctive stone tower that Francis would never forget. After two years of confinement, Francis was able to escape with the help of his mother. He spent two years in that prison. And finally, I guess, mother came up with the idea that I'm going to get my son out of prison. And as I said, she came in with civilian clothes in, hidden underneath her clothes. And he put them on and walked out the prison very casually. Francis fled Prague and eventually arrived in Holland, where he learned cigar making. In a short period, Francis was able to save enough money to purchase a transatlantic ticket. His destination? New York City. New York was a thriving metropolis, swelling with immigrants. Francis moved into a neighborhood with other Czech immigrants and returned to making cigar boxes for an income. Anton and Joseph Corbell, his two brothers, joined him. The California Gold Rush was on with the discovery of gold at Sutter's Mill in 1849. The Corbell brothers made their way to San Francisco seeking their fortune. Because the Panama Canal had yet to be built, the Corbells crossed to the Pacific via the Isthmus of Panama. The journey lasted three years. When Francis and his brothers arrived in San Francisco, the gold rush was over. Francis took a job grading and packing cigars and saw an opportunity to manufacture cigar boxes. With the help of his brothers, he founded the Corbell Cigar Box Company and purchased land in Sonoma and Humboldt counties for its timber. Oh, it had to be very difficult because there was nothing out here, basically. Um, you know, there was just trees, redwoods, you know, and uh, if you've ever been to a redwood forest, you might know it's very thick and very dense and they had to clear the land. Uh, naturally, they used the wood, but they had to clear the land, which no chainsaws, no electricity, muscle and grit had to be tough. Uh, when I was young, I went and saw some of the huge trees they cut, and it totally amazed me what they could do with a tree that was hundreds of feet tall, and you watch them cut it and see it fall, and it was unbelievable. That's all I can say. It was really unbelievable. As their business grew, Francis and his brothers realized they needed reliable year-round transportation for their timber. The Corbells would not have been able to ship uh, any major heavy product like uh, wood uh, to San Francisco and points uh, around the world uh, without um, confining that transportation to the summertime. And also it would have been very, very expensive to be hauled by wagon. Uh, and ox cart or whatever else they had available. After the railroad arrived here in 1876, they basically had direct line access to San Francisco uh, by railroad and ferry boat and then to any point in the world by shipping. The Corbells financed and built their first railway to connect the mill with the world beyond. Their second railroad, the Arcata and Mad River Railway, was completed in 1884. Today, the most visible remnant of the Corbell Transportation Network is the Corbell Railway Station. Like true entrepreneurs, the Corbell brothers sought out new opportunities. They bought a schooner, the Bohemia, and a steam-powered vessel, the North Fork. They also owned and operated a ferry in the San Francisco Bay Area. When they needed a supply of labels for their cigar boxes, the Corbell brothers purchased a printing press which they also used to publish their political opinions in The Wasp, a magazine named for its editorial sting. In 1876, fire destroyed the Corbell Cigar Box factory in San Francisco. 
The loss prompted the Corbell brothers to refocus their attention on operations in Sonoma County. When the Russian River property was cleared of trees, the Corbell brothers looked for new ways to make the land productive. They tried a dairy and a variety of crops, including plums, alfalfa, tobacco, olives, and grapes. Looking for the best fit for the area, the family sent soil samples to the University of California, Davis. The results were revealing. Ah, it's beautiful soil here. We're right on the Russian River. Uh, you know, thousands of years of uh, flooding have created just the most perfect balance to grow wine grapes and champagne grapes here in the lower Russian River Valley. The Corbells released a variety of wines. Within a few years, demand outpaced production and a larger facility was required. The Corbell brothers designed the new winery. Never willing to take shortcuts, they constructed it with bricks from their kiln and wood from their mills. The new winery included a distinct architectural feature, a replica of the tower at the Dalaborka prison where Francis was incarcerated. Now called the Brandy Tower, this turret-like structure is the lasting reminder of the hardships Francis overcame. Francis wanted to produce fine European-style wines, so in 1890, he recruited a university-trained winemaker. The very first winemaker, Frank Joseph Hasek, is kind of an interesting story. He was born in uh, Melnick, Bohemia, and um, actually went to the uh, University of Melnick in their viticultural department. And he was also the only one willing to move from Bohemia to California. So because of Frank's adventurous spirit, he wound up being the first winemaker of Corval. Hasek was knowledgeable in the method champenois tradition, where secondary fermentation occurs inside the bottle. His arrival set the stage for the production of Corbell California Champagne. But there were still challenges ahead. In 1896, the new winery caught fire. The building and its enormous rafters survived thanks to quick-thinking winemakers who doused the flames with freshly crushed grape juice, a reaction that saved the winery at the cost of a year's worth of wine. As the 19th century came to a close, Corbell became one of the most popular California champagnes in the land, and the brothers expanded the House of Corbell with an office in Chicago. In 1906, a powerful earthquake hit San Francisco. The shockwaves leveled buildings in Santa Rosa and reached all the way to the winery. But the winery's sturdy design and construction absorbed the impact of the earthquake without sustaining even a cracked window pane. The Brandy Tower was not as fortunate. It was severely damaged and iron bands still present today were installed for support. When Prohibition began in 1919 and alcoholic beverages were banned, the Corbell brothers reacted by reducing their inventory. During this period, Corbell was permitted to make and sell a limited amount of wine and brandy for altar and medicinal purposes. None of the founding Corbell brothers were to survive the repeal of Prohibition in 1933. But the winery did, and a case of Corbell was delivered to the White House to mark the end of Prohibition. In the early 1950s, the remaining members of the Corbell family sold the winery to Adolf Heck, a third-generation winemaker. Adolf possessed a profound respect for the history of the winery and the method Chapinois tradition. Adolf brought a new vision to the winery. He introduced a unique yeast culture into the secondary fermentation process. Today, Corbell uses descendants of this same culture to make its California champagne. In 1956, Adolf revolutionized champagne by redefining Corbell Brut as a lighter and drier style, introducing a new generation to champagne. He added other innovations as well. Adolf invented the automatic reeling machine. It vibrates the bottles upside down, forcing that yeast into the neck of the bottle. And then as it's vibrating, it goes left, right, left, right, working it into the neck. Hand riddling was an extraordinarily intensive task that required each bottle be turned precisely by hand. Adolf's riddling rack automated the process and eliminated error, ultimately improving the quality of Corbell California champagnes. Adolf Heck's reputation grew and demand for Corbell California Champagne grew with it. When Dad bought the company in 1954, it was a small little tiny company. It was only like 3,000 cases. He was the production guy. He was the lab guy. He was the winemaker, the champagne master. He did the tough part 
of Corbell. He took it from 3,000 cases to up to 150,000 cases. Since taking the reins from his father in 1982, Gary Heck has led Corbell through its most accelerated growth and expansion, extending the product lineup with many styles of California champagne. Corbell maintains its distinction as America's top-selling champagne. Corbell has been a symbol of American celebration since 1882. From premier sporting events to historic occasions, Corbell has been there for life's toasts. What began as an American dream has, over time, become an American icon. Corbell, California. Champagne.